Now, the most important issue for this chapter is the allocation methods. We said we've got DDA, depreciation, depletion, amortization. What type of methods can we use? On the generally accepted accounting principles, we're going to use three different methods, and each one of those methods are based on estimates. Actually, there are really three estimates. The allocation scheme is also estimated, but the two primary estimates, and these are not based on GAAP, this is based on management's judgment. Um, has not, GAAP does not specify the useful life. GAAP does not specify the scrap value. First of all, what's the useful life? Useful life is the period of expected benefit. This is not necessarily equal to the physical life of the asset. It is equal to your expected economic benefit period, the period that you expect to benefit from that asset. The residual value, or the scrap or salvage value, is what you expect to collect in cash when the asset is disposed of. Now, you might have a regular replacement policy. So let's take a look at delivery vans. FedEx has a fleet of trucks. And let's say they turn them in or they trade them in every five years. They know they get 30% of cost back. That becomes the scrap value, the salvage value. What you expect to realize on sale or disposal. The term scrap value, residual value, or salvage value all the same. Now, how do we estimate the useful life? Again, there's no gap standard. How do we estimate the residual? The useful life is generally based on factors like your experience in using the asset, guidelines from the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, the Internal Revenue Service has different tables, and they will tell you that, let's say, for a building, recommended would be 30 years, for example. Uh, automobiles, three years. Machinery, five years. You got a racehorse? They'll tell you how long the racehorse could be depreciated if that's an asset, believe it or not. So you could find IRS guidelines for different assets and classes of assets. There are industry standards, maybe based on your policy of maintaining the asset. Uh, future inadequacy, what does that mean? It means that you have plans of expanding your business so you know you're going to use a machine of a certain output level for five years, then you're going to expand, and you're going to sell that asset. And of course, expected obsolescence, technology. What's the useful life of a, uh, of a laptop? What's the useful life of a desktop computer? It's probably, you know, economically, you're going to use it you know, for two or three years, but based on obsolescence, it's probably declined in value already. Right? because of, of technology. So you have to think about that as well. When you bring in the salvage value, um, scrap values are based on industry standards and expected realization. So I would say, what would be the scrap value? What would be the scrap value of, um, of your laptop? Nothing, right. nothing. In fact, people like to give away. Uh, back in the old days, you know, Michael's talking about computers, I want to say the old days, but you know, first started teaching, there were companies that would actually say, oh, you're a professor, uh, could we donate our computers to your school? Because we've got to get rid of them. It's probably more expensive to dispose of them than to give them away. So uh, they, have, they really don't have any residuals, so that'll depend. Now, here's a question for you. Why don't we use them for, why don't you have a scrap value for tax? You would never use a scrap value for tax. Anyone know why? Well, let me give you at least a bit of information. Um, the tax calls this non-recoverable cost. I don't like that term. I like the term depreciable cost. Or depreciation base depreciable cost or depreciation base. That's cost minus the estimated scrap value. 
So if I use a scrap value, what does it do to the depreciable cost? The higher the scrap value, what happens to the depreciable cost? Reduces it. Reduces it, and that lessens the possible tax deductions you could get. So tax depreciation does not include does not include a scrap value. Tax depreciation does not include a scrap value. Now, the methods that we will use to allocate, and I'm going to fill this in a little bit later with some other numbers, but the gap methods that we can use, and this is true in any type of, whether it's depreciation, depletion, amortization, we've got three basic methods. Let me move this over so I can. So the three basic methods that we use for depreciation and depletion and sometimes amortization, they are, can be used for each. We have something known as straight line, declining balance, and the units of output methods. These are methods we use for depreciation. Now, depreciation, again, is not thought of as a method of valuation. It is an allocation of the cost to the expected periods of benefit. And the three common methods, again, are straight line, declining balance, and units of output, or units of activity. Straight line method applies a constant rate against a constant depreciable, as I said, the book calls it, non-recoverable cost. So therefore, you get the same expense each year. So it's a constant rate. So if I needed to kind of line this up, if I look at straight line, if I take the depreciation rate, Depreciation rate is constant, and the depreciation base is also constant. Constant depreciable cost. So that the amount each year, of course, is constant. And if you plot this out, I mean, if you took a graph and you took depreciation expense over time, straight line, of course, is a straight line. It just plots out in that way. So it's a constant rate multiplied against a constant depreciable cost. That's the method. The next method is declining balance. Now, we're going to use something known as double declining balance. And what that double means, there's actually one and a half declining balance. There used to be triple declining balance. This is a multiple of the straight line rate. So double declining balance means that you're going to be taking double the straight line rate. And it's an accelerated method. You take more depreciation in the early years than the later years. In fact, declining balance is the basis for tax depreciation. Tax depreciation is a little different than what we're doing here, but it is related to the um, declining balance method. So double declining balance methods will be multiples of the straight line rate. Now, you take more expense in the earlier years, 
This tends to make sense not only for tax purposes, but also if you look at this from an economic standpoint, if I had a graph, if I had to plot this out, let's see where I am on it here, okay? If I had to plot this out, and this is depreciation expense, I'll get this into focus in a second. Right, so if I had to take this as a double declining balance, I will take more depreciation in the first year than, let's say, in the last year of the assets left. The acceleration is not only reasonable for tax, why can I justify that for financial reporting? Think about all these concepts and theories. What, what, what concepts would make accelerated depreciation sensible? Well, let me just get this. Yeah. Yes. You know, it's more relevant in the sense that it's more current. Anybody? I was just going to, and maybe I wasn't really thinking about this question, but I was thinking, like, in terms of a car, it depreciates a lot more when you first get it. Right, so economically it's relevant in that it's mirroring the actual usage of the, well, the actual value, it, it gets closer to what the value is, what's happening to the value of the asset. But more importantly, I think from our perspective, does it make sense? I think what you said, you got a car, you use it more when it's newer, so therefore is it giving you more output? In a sense, it gives you more benefit and it matches better with the benefit. So theoretically, the accelerated methods match better with the benefits you're getting. Higher revenues, because the older the asset, the less revenue it generates. So the idea of relevance in the sense of having it um, sort of correlate with what's really happening with the value of the asset. But it's important to understand that theoretically it's, it's matching with the higher revenues early on. So revenues are also higher, productivity is higher here than it is at the end of the asset's life. Now, we're going to achieve acceleration by taking a constant rate which is twice the straight line rate against a declining net book value. And that's cost minus accumulated. Cost minus accumulated. So what happens is that the net value of the asset declines, and you're multiplying it by a constant rate. The rate is twice the string line rate. And let me just tell you that in this calculation, you're ignoring scrap value. In that calculation, the scrap value is ignored. We bring it in later, but it's ignored now. By the way, what's the appreciable cost again? It's cost minus scrap. So straight line uses scrap value, right? Straight line uses the scrap value. All right, and finally, the units of production, the units of output. Units of output will get a rate of depreciation per unit. And that's going to be multiplied against actual output. So the actual pattern of depreciation will vary. Like this, I mean, I can't, I can't tell you where actual output's going to be. So it could be all over, high or low, depending on the outputs. The actual pattern of this will vary. vary. So those are the three methods. So it's really always going to be a rate against the base. That's the way it's going to work. So 
let's take some illustrations. Um, and again, it'll vary each year. Uh, generally, by the way, wasting assets or natural resources will use units of output. And again, all the methods used, depreciable cost, straight line, and units of output, except double declining. Declining balance does not use scrap value. Declining balance does not use scrap value. OK. So any questions on the, sort of the intro before we do some examples? Yeah. Uh, scrap value is ignored in the units of output. No, no. This is, um, we use scrap value in this calculation. And we use scrap value in this calculation uh, here. Because it's really cost minus the scrap value. That's the depreciable cost. All right, any other questions? All right, now let me set this problem up. And I'll just going to use, I'll take this off the board. Any, any questions on that? I'll go over it again if you need to. All right. So let's go through an example. And the first example says that we purchased the truck, get the same truck we bought before at 80000 Cost is 80. The estimated scrap value is 8. So the depreciable cost is 72. So the depreciable cost is 72. So cost minus scrap gives you the depreciation base. Now, for the straight line depreciation, the constant rate is the straight line rate. And I'll put this up on the screen in a second, but the straight line rate is 1 over the useful line. That's the straight line rate. So in this case, if the estimated life is 5 years, the straight line rate is 20%. Straight line rate is 20%. And if we multiply 20% by 72,000, we get our depreciation expense of 14,4. Depreciation expense is 14,4. Or what we could have done is taken the typical straight line formula that you know, uh, which is cost minus the scrap value divided by the length, the estimated useful length. Cost minus scrap divided by the estimated length. You don't necessarily have to use the rate. I like using the rate because that's the way you see it for tax purposes. They'll say it depreciates at a rate of 20%. So nothing you haven't seen. Right? You've been playing with straight line since the adjusting entries chapter, right? Chapter three or four or something like that. Um, yeah, any questions on straight line? Not to uh, diminish, and again, of course, the book value at the end of year one is uh, 65, six. You know, so if we take the accumulated, Net book value is 65.6 at the end of that period. So again, not to minimize straight line um, because you've seen it before. Any questions on the straight line approach? It's a constant rate of 20% against a constant depreciable cost. 
Appreciable cost is constant at 72. The rate is constant at 20%. You always take 20% of 72 for the next five years. The asset will be depreciated. And by the way, what will happen is if you depreciate this down over the next five years, you're going to wind up with 72,000. So let me show you what would happen. And then I'll take some questions. This is only year one. So we're going down each year. At the end of the useful life of the asset, what, what remains? Scrap value of 8,000. So at the end of the life of the asset, you depreciate it down, you got scrap value. Questions on straight line? Now, the next method is probably the most difficult and not really terribly difficult, but it's got more complications, and that's the double declining balance. Double declining balance will take twice the straight line rate against a declining net book value. And let me make a note, and I put this in red so you can see it. It's the declining net book value, but it's at the beginning of the year. So it's the beginning net book value. So we're going to take twice the straight line rate. In this example, we know that's going to be 2 times 20%, or 40% against the beginning net book value. The depreciation base that is declining is cost minus accumulated. Now, here is the, um, the major disaster on exams. You forget and you put the scrap value instead of accumulated. It's not depreciable cost. It's not cost minus scrap. It's cost minus accumulated depreciation. And by the way, if you flip over the, I got to show you how to use the calculator because it's got a lot of versatility. If you flip over the HP 12C, it shows you how to calculate depreciation. Don't do it now. I'll have to show you how to do it. But you can even flip it over, but don't try it. So yeah, you, you'll see instructions on how to do it. All right. And then, of course, the straight line rate is 40%. And here is the way it works. I'm going to go through this slowly because I know that um, it is not always as perhaps intuitive as I would like it to be. What will happen is that you take the beginning net book value. When you first bought the asset at the very beginning of the first year, what's the book value? Well, if we have no depreciation, the very beginning book value is 80000 I take 40% of 80000 that means that the depreciation expense is 32 in that first year. Now, that is pretty good because think about from a tax perspective what you were getting on the straight line. So on the straight line, let's just map this out this way. On the straight line, you're getting 14.4 every year. And now in year number one, I'm able to take 32,000. So from a tax perspective, I'm writing off 32,000 instead of 14.4. So using an accelerated method, not only better matches cost with revenue, better mirrors the market value, it is not the market value, but it does provide you with the tax benefits plus the matching. Now, of course, the book value now, if you took 32, in your first year, the book value at the end of year number one, beginning of year two, is what? 48. 40% 40 of 48 is 19.2, and the book value then drops to 28.8, because you just added here. Twenty-eight eight, 
is your book value at the end of year two, but the beginning of year three. 40% of that is 11,520, and that's the depreciation. Now notice what's happening is that right now, you started with 32, and then you went to 19,2 for year two. And then in year three, you've got 11,520 as your depreciation. So notice that the tax benefits of using declining balance kind of go away after a certain point. But what we'll see in the next chapter when we look at the time value of money, you're better off getting higher tax deductions today because you have that money in your pocket right now. And even if you have to pay it back in later years, you're paying back in cheaper dollars. So by accelerating, you get current tax benefits. So again, uh, 11,520 is your depreciation. And you, you get the idea, net book value goes to 17,280. Now, this continues, all right? So next year, the depreciation is 6912. All right, 6,912, and the net book value is 10,368. I'm going to stop right there and, and point something out. Um, so right now, after four years, net book value is... 10,368. If you took 40% of that, you're going to bring the book value below what? 8,000. Now, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, that may not be a problem, but if you want to maintain, and the calculator does this, so if you use the HP 12C, to do depreciation, and you put in a scrap value, it's going to force the last year's depreciation. So here's what has to happen. You have to find the depreciation in here that will give you a book value of 8, which means that the total accumulated has to go to 72. It's going to have to go to, uh, I'm sorry, that should, that's not right. This is that's the book value. Book value is 10,368. And you want this to be 8. So the most that you could depreciate in here is how much? 2,368 for year 5. The most you could depreciate in that last year is 2,368. And that brings the accumulated up to 72, and it allows you to have a book value of 8,000. So that's the only quirk of using the double decline. Now, we're going to talk about that again, but that's the only problem with double decline. That you have to force, this last year is forced. So I'll show you that right now. The last year is forced because the book value would then go below the residual value. It would go below the residual value. Now, any questions on that last year? Because again, you really need to practice this. It's pretty simple. But in that last year, what we're saying is that right now I've got a book value of 10,368. I've got to get it to 8,000. So I'll just take the difference. And that becomes the last year's depreciation. Now, comparing the two methods, which we started doing, when you look at the comparison, we note that, and I mentioned this already, that in the first two years, you get more depreciation benefit by using double declining than you do on the straight line, and then it reverses. So when we look at this diagram, let me redraw this for you. Okay, so this is 
is the depreciation. This will be the gear. And this is going to be straight lines right here. And that's going to be the DDP. Typically, the way this will work is that you're going to see the double declining balance for tax purposes. And you'd probably be using straight line on your books. So in here, you get a tax advantage. Then you'll get a reversal. And then in here, you get a tax disadvantage. So you get the tax benefits early on. And as I said, from a time value of money perspective, that's what you want. You get a tax advantage early. And you save more money today, even though you may have to pay it back later. Now, of course, in reality, if companies are expanding, you really may not pay back that amount on a net basis. What I mean by that is what happens if this company expands? Let's say the company starts to expand before the reversal takes place. What happens to those curves? They sort of kick out, right? So what will happen is that by expanding and growing and investing in new assets, you push the curves out. So yeah, reversal happens, but the benefits you get from the expansion outweigh the payments that you have to make. So we'll see this more and more throughout the curriculum that from a tax planning perspective, you know, you think about, yeah, there's a reversal in here, I'm paying more tax, but actually as long as I expand, I offset with more benefits. I offset with more benefits. Is yes. there any advantage for the units and output? Um, units and output may or may not give you advantage. I'll show you, um, you know, in some of the one of the uh, problems that we're doing, it's possible that if you know that your output, I mean, we talk about matching, units of output matches exactly, right? So it could be. But it's generally used for, um, depletion of natural resource. You don't usually see it in a um, um, depreciation setting. So the way you did this with the percentage, I mean, makes sense for this problem when it's five years and 20%. But let's say it was six years. I'm right. dealing with having to double 16 months of percentage. Could you right. divide by three to get that? Yeah, I mean, whatever, yeah. I mean, if it's um, whatever you want to do, you could divide it, but the, 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 the percentage has to stay constant. Yeah. All right, any other questions? Anything else? Yes? Just out of curiosity, um, so you're doing this for five years and expensing all the depreciation is affecting the taxes. Um, mm -hmm. At the end of the five years, are you at an obligation to that? Like, what if the trust was like, you thought it's still here and could use it? No, you can hold them on to the, the, you're bringing up a very good point because the, if you use an accelerated depreciation under U.S. tax law, if you say to the IRS, I'm using this truck for five years, and you use it for less, they recapture the difference between straight line and the accelerated method. They're going to take back the benefits. So if you invest for five years, you have to hold it for five years. But it's not the other way around. Now, if we depreciate an asset for five years and use the asset for 30, we could be using assets with zero book value. Now, that's not a problem in, in, in a one asset firm, it's a problem, right? Because then you got revenue with no productive assets. But in a large firm, new assets come in, old assets are fully depreciated. All right, let me, let me just do the units of output, then we'll take a quick stretch. Um, anything else on the declining balance on the comparison? So straight line, 
constant each year. Declining balance is higher for the first two years, then it reverses, and of course, the same amount, and this is an important point to leave you with on any depreciation, any comparison method, um, accounting methods do not change total cash flows. Let's forget about tax. So both companies paid 80,000, let's say, for this truck. So it doesn't change the cash flows, and it doesn't change the total effect of depreciation. What it does is it moves the depreciation to different periods. So all this really does is it shifts income. So what you've done here is you've shifted income to later periods if you use this. It doesn't change the total. It just shifts the recognition. And that's all we do in accounting is we change the timing of the recognition of certain events when we allocate. Yeah, stated units of output. Same thing, except that the truck is going to be driven for 18,000 miles. That's the expected output for this vehicle. You, I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry, 80,000 uh, miles. So you, you pay 80,000 for the truck, Scrap value is still 8. 80,000 miles is the expected total output of that vehicle. The actual output for year one is 18,000. Here's the depreciation rate. The depreciation rate is 90 cents per mile. It's cost minus scrap value. So you take the depreciable cost, 72,000, divided by the maximum output that you expect. Now remember, this is not dollars. So in a way, when someone wrote this problem, it was kind of unfortunate they used the same mileage as the cost. But not to get confused, that's 80,000 miles. And that truck will depreciate at a rate of 90 cents per mile. Now, the actual output for year one is 18,000. So therefore, you would depreciate a total of 16,200. And every year, every year, the rate of depreciation stays the same. The actual output changes, and the depreciation would change. So it varies based on actual output, or vary based on actual output. Now, um, I think this method is used mostly for depletion of natural resources. It makes a lot of sense from a matching perspective. Um, as you're mining, I mean, you think that a deposit is going to have, you know, 600,000 barrels of oil. As you start extracting the oil, you would then take a cost per barrel and add that to your inventory. So you generally don't expense it, it gets added to inventory typically, but it is operating with a scrap value. So just to remind you, you are still using the same depreciation base as, um, as straight line. Right, so that's the units of output. And uh, before, I know I said I was gonna break after this, but just to show you, that's the book value, just to show you one last um, justification for accelerated depreciation, going back to, I think, lots of the things that people said uh, about the relevance of declining balance depreciation. Notice that in the early years of an automobile, it depreciates more, but the repair cost is less. Later on, the repair cost goes up, but the rate at which the car loses value is less. So in a way, you almost have a constant cost of using the asset. In the early years, the car costs you most is depreciation. That's your highest cost. And later on in, in the car's life, the highest cost is repairs. The depreciation is a lot less relative to the repairs themselves. So that's another, I guess, theoretical justification for the accelerator. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So if we, uh, what I'm going to do is I want to talk a little bit about changes in estimate, and um, if you change the useful life of an asset, 
if you change the scrap value, or even if you change one of the gap depreciation methods. And a question came up during the break. Let me remind you that these methods are gap, but estimation techniques are not so that um, you, you and I could both use straight line. You could pick eight years, I'll pick four, perfectly acceptable. So the estimation of useful life and scrap value are up to the company, but the methods are straight line, declining balance, units about, but those are gap. Now, if you need to change your accounting method for depreciation, your useful life, your scrap value, the change is what we call prospective. It means that the change is only in the current period and the future. There's no retroactive restatement, right? So you wouldn't restate. We're talking about restatements before you would not restate. So what would happen is that any change, whether it's in depreciation method, whether it's useful life, whether it's scrap value, has to start with the remaining book value. You can't start from the beginning. So in our example, if the asset was, we know it was 80,000, we know the asset was 80,000, you can't start with 80,000. You have to start with the net book value. So in this case, the first step in changing what they decided to do was rather than saying the truck was going to last only five years, they said it was going to last seven. So after four years of depreciation, they said that they decided to change the useful life. The net book value, the net book value at the end of four years is 22.4. That's what you start with. You can't start with 80. Why not? You don't have 80,000 anymore because you've already used up four years. So you start with the book value of 22.4. Then how many years remain? Well, the original life was five. You already used up four. You had one year left. And instead of saying that the truck would last five years in total, we're now saying it's going to last seven. So we've added two years to the life. So you used up four, five original, two that we expected. Um, in addition, so that makes it seven, minus the four is the new light is three years. The scrap value stayed the same. And we could have changed the scrap value. So remaining book value divided by the new useful life and the scrap value stayed the same. That scrap value could have been modified and that is 4,800. And it only changes the current year and future years does not change any prior periods. Does not change the prior periods. Okay. All right. Now, I'm just thinking. Maybe we'll do some. Um, I, I'd probably be better off. I do have another example for you, which is really pretty much the same. So let me. I may go back to that. But let's go. Let's go over some questions. I think I want to make you do a couple of um, of calculations. And by the way, just one last warning about the units of output. If you have a units of output problem, you've got to be very careful that you don't depreciate more than the number of units that you anticipate. So for example, if in our illustration before, we said that we were going to have 80,000, the total was 80,000 miles. So let's write it out. In the first year, in year one, they had 18,000 miles. And they multiply that by 90 cents. That's year one. And that, would, that was an appreciation. In year two, what if I told you that they actually produced 90,000 units? How much depreciation would you take? Ninety cents times how, times how much? How many units? What's the maximum miles? Eighty. 
So would you multiply this 90,000 miles by 90 cents? What's the most you can do here? 62. Because you can't go over 80,000 miles. So that's the only thing you have to be careful about with respect to with respect to the units of alpha. You cannot exceed 80,000 miles. So if you're doing a problem, make sure you don't go over the 80,000. Because normally, I mean, I've seen this happen, especially on exams. You just roll in one, it's easy, 90, 90 cents times this, 90 cents, and all of a sudden, you get to the third year, and you wind up over depreciating the asset. You can't depreciate more than, this, than the depreciable cost. You can't depreciate more than the original cost if there is no scrap value. 